Maybe it's time to get started. I see 30 plus people on board. Maybe a bit more will show up, but uh, it's already three past. And so we have a bunch of things on the agenda. Um, so this is the third session of the workshop, and uh, we'll be talking about potential improvements. And Eve Schooler actually will, will uh, lead this session. I'm just going to cover the reminder about uh, the um, ways of working or ground rules. So in case you're just joining in for the first time on this session, then welcome. And uh, a reminder again that the session is recorded and recordings will be published. Your position papers are public already. And of course, this is a professional meeting and we expect professional behavior and no kind of harassment is, is uh, uh, accepted. And uh, just a reminder again that there's lots of people with very different backgrounds. So um, do explain clearly what, what you mean and be polite and learn from the other's viewpoints. I think in this sense, in particular, we will be talking about some of the technical things. So um, do keep that in mind. Um, with that, I think I will just hand it over to you, Eve. And, uh, Okay, if you want to advance to the next slide. Yeah. So, um, one thing that was quite helpful yesterday was to sort of reiterate what some of the goals were. Um, and so, um, we've done that again today and look forward to um, you helping us to refine um, our objectives. Um, and to hopefully meet them. <laughs> we clearly are wandering into territory where we are discussing potential solutions today and um, also some of the feasibility behind them and their benefits. And can we quantify those things are, so that we can arrive at answering the questions, are the benefits significant? How do they make an impact? Can they and how much do they make an impact? And, um, for example, some of the um, points that Vesna made on Monday that were quite helpful were to consider, um, you know, we, we spoke a lot yesterday about um, how energy usage has remained rather stable or static, but um, the directives coming from the UN IPCC and elsewhere is the urgency to reduce um, our usage of both resources, electricity, and um, ultimately carbon footprint um, and emissions. And so, one of the uh, ways to consider improvements is, you know, by how much is it 10% less per year um, uh, or some other uh, goal that we're trying to meet? Certainly, there have been uh, places like the WRI, the World Resource Institute. Um, that have tried to quantify how much faster we need to accelerate our efforts uh, to meet these goals um, and uh, in terms of, say, the introduction of renewables, the uh, moving off of fossil fuel and how quickly we need to move to the electrification of transportation. And so it would be good to have an ambition for um, our venues, um, our areas of, of impact. Um, another uh, area that was um, suggested was to consider disaster scenarios, uh, emergency situations and extreme climate um, as baseline requirements. Uh, for example, in the United States, um, the uh, NOAA, which is considered the, the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, our trusted sort of weather uh, and climate um, organization, has said that in the last decade, certainly in the United States, the number of billion dollar um, emergencies has doubled, for example. Um, and then uh, other kinds of ways to talk about improvements or caveats is to beware or avoid techno optimism that everything's going to work out. Technology is our savior. The efficiency paradox that the more we uh, save, the more we use and also um, power differentials. And the, the question to you as an audience is, are there other impacts elsewhere? What kinds of trade-offs exist? What kinds of incentives? Uh, that's certainly uh, quite important to, and, and who are we trying to incent? Um, and uh, as well as security issues that sometimes, more than sometimes, uh, are at odds with our goals for efficiency. 
Um, and uh, so the scope today is um, there's no need to focus only on the things that the IETF, even though we're sponsoring this workshop. So it's not only the things that the IETF can do, but what can we do collectively? We are, so I would advance the slides. Um, if you could, Yari. And uh, we have uh, five terrific talks today. Uh, we've allotted about 50 minutes to them. So for all of you speakers, uh, we're trying to stay within about 10 minutes for the talks. Um, uh, we're lucky to have a conversation on metrics, of course, so that will underpin everything. Uh, uh, Alexander Clem will be speaking to that. We're going to have two talks on general thoughts um, on the solutions and trade offs. Uh, Carlos Pignataro and Suresh Krishnan, general thoughts on solutions and trade offs that include routing, for example. Uh, Alvaro Ratana and Russ White will speak to that. And um, importantly, you know, the data formats that underpin uh, much of this, Brendan Moran and Karsten Borman, and uh, a return to our beloved topic, um, multicast, um, uh, the discussion and debate around multicast that Luis Navarre and uh, Francois Michel uh, will discuss. We have about 70 minutes of budget for discussion, and if it's anything like the last few days, uh, it's been, which is which have been fantastic. Uh, I really am looking forward to that. And please continue to drop your comments and questions as well into the chat window. And we will try to um, service some of those, service and surface some of those as well. Um, and please continue to uh, either jump in or raise your hand uh, to ask questions as well. With that, I think we are over to you, Alex. Okay, thank you, Eve. Let me just sh share. Okay, can you see, can, can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes. Yep. Over to you. Okay, great. Yeah, so yeah, uh, good morning <laughs> or good afternoon, um, uh, everyone. So yeah, so the first presentation here concerns metrics. This is actually based uh, off of a draft or the submission was, was, was based on the draft um, that you see uh, uh, referenced here uh, along with a bunch of co-authors uh, whose name you see also there. So um, let me jump into that. So context, we don't need to talk much about that. Uh, I think clearly, uh, this is what the workshop is all about. Uh, the fact of basically how how we, how the ITF, how the network community can uh, contribute towards addressing one of mankind's grand challenges, which is basically reducing carbon footprint. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think as we are all aware, is networks are uh, both an enabler for solutions for solutions, but also a contributor to the problem uh, itself. And there are, of course, many contributors to network energy efficiency today, um, many of which go perhaps beyond what the, where the IETF can, can contribute directly. Um, uh, so we talk about uh, hardware advances, uh, transmission technology, uh, sustainable power sources, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, the question is, of course, which are the ways in which the ITF can contribute? And even if perhaps the factors in the overall equation of things may seem small, um, uh, even if it's just a smaller slice of the pie, basically everything counts. And perhaps even if it's not, uh, well, we saw yesterday Michael uh, Welsel's uh, diagram of the uh, of the of, of the moon and the stars and the planets, and even if it's not a major planet, maybe if uh, maybe a moon would make an Im impact uh, already as well. So. Um, of course, where networking can contribute, this is the subject of the discussions or further discussions that we will have here. Uh, but there are quite a few potential things or basically areas to look at. Uh, one area concerns certainly basically in the area of uh, how you manage networks, how you deploy networks, how you optimize networks. And networking standards play, do play a role and enable those. And these are um, yeah, a number of things, or so basically anything from well, you need to provision uh, networks, uh, therefore you do need to dimension them. You need to manage oversubscriptions. We talked about uh, potentially to do peak shaving as a way to, to, uh, to contain the carbon footprint uh, and so forth. Uh, and the function of these are of course related uh, to, to yeah, ultimately to, to management type of functions. And um, 
uh, management and also controllers have have been a long time about uh, optimizing various parameters. And in the past, we parameterized uh, things such as utilization or, or cost or, or or service level objectives and so forth. And in a way, uh, and at the end of the day, energy usage is just another great parameter that 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 can be uh, that can be optimized that way. And uh, well, there are many other ways, I, um, such as where do you place virtual networking functions? How do you plan routes, uh, segments, paths, and so forth? And of course, for all of this, how do you moderate also the trade-offs? Because while we want to reduce the carbon intensity, we of course still need to keep in mind that there are service levels that need to be delivered, um, the utilization that needs to be maintained uh, to make things uh, economical and uh, and so forth. Um, well, beyond management, there is uh, there are other aspects, for instance, control. Can you could you, for instance, would it make an impact if you can select from greener path alternatives, as an example? Um, then there are network architecture issues. Actually, some of this came through also in, in earlier talks. For instance, where would we cache from a carbon standpoint? Where does it make most sense? Uh, we, here, are obviously, again, trade-offs involved. Uh, how much do we spend in transmitting data versus uh, storing it uh, elsewhere? And potentially even things such as protocol designs, um, and protocol design itself. Uh, can, could we, for instance, uh, would it help, for instance, if we uh, play with uh, smoothing versus bursting of traffic uh, and, and so forth? But regardless what uh, measures in the end are, are selected, it all starts with the visibility. And uh, there's this uh, famous saying by Peter Drucker, if you can't ma measure it, uh, you can't manage it. And one might add, basically, or you could not assess eff how effective are your solutions, uh, and you cannot devise solutions that rely, for instance, on control loops. And so, accordingly, you do, you do need visibility, and visibility starts with the right metrics. This is really basically the foundation for 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 everything else. And this is also this happens to be also an area um, uh, that is very <laughs> actionable, and where the ITF may be able to make an impact. So, uh, concerning metrics, uh, well, the question then is basically what metrics do we need to define? What metrics are needed? This is, of course, very much driven always by the types of questions that we want to answer. Uh, how do we assess the effectiveness of a solution? How do we compare between design alternatives? How can we optimize a network deployment? How do we know if one is better versus the other, um, et cetera, et cetera? And so, and uh, yeah, and um, uh, so, the, the, in this, yeah. this is also what should the metrics cover, right? We have, of course, the energy usage efficiency, uh, where the scope is the network itself. Then there are also, but then the question is beyond the usage e efficiency. There was the question, well, how are the energy sources, right? Are they sustainable? Mm -hmm. So, forth. so basically, this this basically goes beyond the network in a narrow sense, if you will. Uh, addressing the entire deployment, and then you can get further still, such as, for instance, um, yeah, the the need for well, basically taking into account manufacturing life cycle, uh, the need for cooling, and so forth, all of those things. So, with the metrics, we want to provide a holistic picture that can be provided that 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 uh, can account for the whole picture at the end of the day, not not just uh, uh, not just the part, and that can help us basically address. Um, the question that we want to have and that can us help us enable the control loops of you have these UDA type of control loops, which is depicted uh, here. Um, yeah, and we want to enable them and um, again, based on metrics. So, uh, getting to the metrics. So, when we look at the metrics, well, we uh, look at basically how to, how we, uh, so one question is basically how can we structure the metric space? <laughs> and uh, the obvious way to start is, of course, with the device and equipment. Uh, but that in itself probably is not enough. Uh, we want to know also basically about the flows or service instances and so forth. Uh, we want to also assess, for instance, the carbon intensity of paths, and also talk about the network at la at large. And uh, here's and basically, and we want to address all of these these along all of the three verticals, if you will, the energy usage efficiency. This is actually where the current focus of the draft is. But we don't want to forget about the other factors as well. So with this, let me um, uh, turn to some of the metrics um, that we can identify. Just a disclaimer, it's not a comprehensive list. Um, some may be speculative, uh, and we are also not talking about the problems of how to instrument some of them, which is, which may be uh, easier for some cases than it is for others. So at the device and equipment level, and sorry, this is a little bit busy, but basically there are 
um, yeah, a bunch of things. It basically starts with uh, standard stuff that one would uh, expect on, on, on data sheets and so forth. So basically, this is just the device ratings, if you will. What are the power consumptions when idle at virus light uh, loads at various configuration and so forth. Um, then for the current uh, aspect of what this is actually using, using, of course, we want to know what is the current power consumption of a system, of a line card, of a port, and so forth. Um, we want to be able to potentially um, know the path. We want to basically know this for different time intervals and system start for the past minute and so forth. And uh, in addition to these absolute measures, we want to also normalize or derive metrics uh, so that we can assess the actual efficiency. So we want to relate it, for instance, in terms of, well, okay, this is how much power we consume, but how does it relate to the, uh, to the amount of traffic um, that we are um, uh, actually uh, passing and so forth. So, well, then in addition to the consumption metrics, uh, as mentioned, there are uh, the other aspects such as, for instance, source sustainability. Of course, that basically would basically uh, increase the scope. It basically becomes more, we want to manage the overall ICT environment, which might include uh, power sources and so forth. Um, but among the things that can certainly be done there is also to maintain uh, something like power source sustainability ratings, um, which reflect, well, which are either obtained from an energy provider or which might uh, reflect the operator's uh, mix of energy sources. Um, and then likewise, as we extend it, there can be beyond power source sustainability ratings, there might be also device sustainability ratings uh, that basically rate the device as a whole, how eco-friendly is it, uh, replacement lifecycle considerations, uh, metrics where you could, for instance, indicate how, you, how the energy debt incurred by the manufacturing of a device uh, gets amortized uh, over, over the equipment uh, lifetime. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, and of course more. In the interest of time, let me just uh, move on. Um, so, uh, because uh, as mentioned, uh, it's also important that we move also beyond equipment and so forth it's, itself, because this is where, where a lot of the networking functions and operational things are also to be found. So, um, uh, one important aspect concerns flows. How can we relate carbon intensity to flows or also to instances of services? So uh, metrics of interest here are, for instance, the uh, amortized energy that is consumed over the duration of a flow. Um, so basically the power budget, if you will, that, that could be uh, um, uh, yeah, assigned or associated with a given flow. Uh, and also potentially, and this might be important for optimization things, is really what is the incremental energy that would be consumed that would not have been consumed otherwise? Of course, we heard yesterday, and this is basically an excerpt from the, from the the diagram from from Dan Sheen's <laughs> um, uh, talk yesterday. Of course, if we have a step function, then this may be zero, so this may not be interesting. But in those cases, it will be, of course, uh, on the other hand, very important to know when these steps are occurring. So basically, we want to know basically when an action would actually trigger the next uh, upgrade cycle that would uh, essentially basically uh, up level. Uh, the thing to the to the next level and so uh, and so forth. Um, well, then beyond flows, there are paths. So uh, clearly, it's also uh, yeah, as we want to optimize paths and perhaps optimize path selection and so forth. It may be interesting to have um, paths, uh, things such as path sustainability ratings. These might be functions of the ratings of the different hops that are being traversed. So does it include uh, dirty devices, if you will, or is it uh, composed uh, of, of, of clean devices? Um, and the function could be anything, right? It could be a, an average, it could be the sum, it could be the maximum, what, what have you. Uh, and likely, we, we may want to know also basically what is a normalized power consumption across the path to make them more comparable. And uh, then finally, and of course, that's the purpose of this. We want to basically uh, reduce the total carbon footprint of the network as a whole. So we want to be, we will also need to aggregate a lot of these metrics uh, for the entire uh, deployment. And uh, well, so uh, just uh, yeah, to, 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 uh, before concluding, there are just a few other considerations that I want to mention. So one aspect concerns, of course, well, these, well, the first step are the metrics. Uh, the second step, these things will need to be instrumented. Um, 
there are a couple of thoughts there, more discussion items really. Um, energy consumption may be easier to measure than actual carbon emissions. So this is basically certainly one, uh, one uh, thread of uh, discussion here. And uh, likewise, basically, if you want to obtain uh, metrics across uh, paths and for flows and so forth, basically, this uh, this will be more than just instrumenting a. Uh, yeah, this may this may involve inman mechanisms or what have you, uh, more than just uh, instrumenting a d device agent, if you will. Uh, another aspect concerns um, a certification and compliance. So basically. Uh, if we do uh, use these metrics to optimize carbon intensity, it is of course important to have instrumentation that is accurate. Otherwise, it may be counterproductive, and it may also be particularly important when regulation and monetary incentives get involved. When if you say if you claim well, I offer a greener service, and maybe charge something for it, just as an example, how would you actually know that this is true? Um, Third consideration is uh, uh, one. So one of the questions is also how we can consider how we can treat this not just as a problem for the operator, but ultimately also attribute the energy usage to users and confront users with the choices of the actions um, regarding the carbon uh, footprint. And um, yeah, anyway, so this this concludes what I wanted to say. I want to mention again, I, I believe these a lot of these metrics and what's related to this is quite actionable in the ITF. This is, I believe, where we can make an in impact. Um, and uh, once metrics are defined, there are several areas to, to look at basically next. Uh, this includes things such as Yang models, potentially protocol extensions with certain um, to, to support energy parameters. Uh, of course, solutions and use cases to drive each of those needs need to um, need need to be defined. And uh, finally, also just to mention, as, as I mentioned, this is based on a, on a draft. Um, uh, we want to ad, uh, advance that uh, as well. All right, thanks. That's all I have. Thank you for that excellent summary and talk. Um, I'm perusing the. Uh, chat window, a lot of wonderful comments there. Uh, any, I think we have time for maybe one question. Okay, let's move on then to the next presentation, the general thoughts on solutions. Um, and Excuse me? Yes. I actually raised my hand. Oh, there so. you are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have to help me. I'm actually not in my home today. I'm somewhere else. And yeah, is yeah, very no, small no, screen. No, no so worries yes, at okay. all. And then changing screens and all that. I I, I, yeah. I know all about it. So no worries. Pinella, no. What so, is your question? Yeah. So the question was really. Uh, so so you are presenting a lot of different options here, or or possibilities rather, and. Uh, of course, there is a there is already a body of standards, both when it comes to energy performance, uh, especially in relation to networks, and uh, also in relation to GHG emissions and so on from uh, bodies like uh, uh, the ETC, European Standardization Body, uh, and the ITU. So I was curious if you have done any like a gap analysis or, or something in relation to your work or if they, this is a, a later step? Well, I think uh, gap analysis needs to be done, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is being seen as a, as a later step. So basically defining the metrics or basically coming up with a set of comprehensive metrics is, a, uh, is I, I think, the, the first step. And then from that, basically, then the question will be the next thing, what, yeah, what exactly, what are the gaps? And what of the metrics, um, uh, and, and how should they be, be prioritized? Right? Because there are a lot of possibilities uh, for metrics. Uh, some of them may be more useful than others, or some of them may be uh, well. For, or there may be also certain use cases that may want to be prioritized that require some of the metrics, but not others. But that would be, uh, yeah, I think that would be the outcome then of yeah of further discussions and and and, and the next step. Okay, so, so just to clarify the question, the, the, I think there are other bodies who has also worked mm -hmm. on developing Absolutely. metrics. So it was more gap analysis in relation to the metrics rather than in relation to data. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great clarification. Let us move to the next presentation and it looks like Suresh is gonna give that presentation. Over to you. So um, I just wanna, uh, like, I think like uh, Alex like and I, 
<laughs> like and Carlos, we kind of agree on a lot of the things, right? Like, you know, we, I looked at the papers as well. So we have like, you know, very similar thoughts on a lot of the things. Uh, I do, ha I kind of want to emphasize on the things where uh, we, we didn't really have the same kind of scope in the uh, papers, right? So, um, so one thing uh, that's like, I think like uh, pretty much everybody in here knows, right? Like with the scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. And um, so one thing that was kind of like, you know, new to a lot of us is that like, you know, scope one and scope two are mandatory to report in most of the jurisdictions, um, uh, whether it's Europe or US or like even like some place in Asia. So those like get a lot, lot of priority, right? Like in, in when like things are getting reported, like, you know, everybody looks at scope one and scope two and how to like reduce that and, um, you know, how to get to net zero there. But scope three is like kind of outside the control of the arc, right? Uh, so the whether it's usage of the products or like you know the energy that's consumed like you know the like by the organization and how it's like you know getting produced but like in our industry right at least in the networking industry the the scope three emissions are like much larger so this is obviously like not to any precise scale but kind of to give you like an absolute idea of like these things like you know the scope three like is much larger than even scope one and scope two put together so uh, we need to kind of focus a little bit on the scope three emissions because like, you know, our organizations uh, themselves are focusing on scope one and scope two because of like, you know, regulatory and, and, and uh, legal uh, things to report. So, um, uh, and one thing I wanted to call out is like scope three for somebody is like scope two and scope one for somebody else. And I think this is kind of in the same direction as what Alex was talking about, right? Like, you know, when like people are operating uh, gear made by some network vendor, right? Like, you know, they are really in the reporting chain for that right as they need to report those things but uh, as like you know the networking industry ourselves like we need to kind of help the customers like reduce their uh, like scope one and scope two which could be our scope three emissions and uh, so one thing that has kind of changed over the years is like you know we kind of had like you know i would say three things that we um optimize for um like you know back in the day right like you know we kind of try to maximize the throughput minimize the latency and increase the availability of the system itself right and so that's kind of changed like over the past like i would say like decade or so right like energy efficiency is another angle and i um i'm not not to like take anything away from this but i think russ's point is like this is an np complete problem is like really really uh relevant here so what we're trying to do is like kind of make like smart choices uh, with energy efficiency in mind. So like, you know, we are kind of trying to bound uh, the um, the usage of the other dimensions, like, you know, in kind of trying to find uh, energy efficient, I would say frontier for lack of a better term. And this also includes stuff like uh, circular economy stuff, right? Like, you know, where does this come from? There's like, um, Alex talked about like, you know, metrics, right? But like stuff happens much before that. So is it like something that we can do with modularity is there something that we can um, uh, do with like packaging? Um, what kind of power supplies are sitting there? Right? So a lot of the things are like even pre-metric, right? Like, so this is like more static things uh, that we can measure through the supply chain, but it's also something we kind of have to consider in the overall life cycle. And similarly, like, you know, we have some programs, at least like at Cisco, we have some programs like for like, you know, recycling the hardware through the thing. So all those things need to get considered um, uh, when we do the uh, sustainability measurements. So we see kind of like you know, three phases uh, of like, you know, getting through this, right? Like, so we start off with visibility. I think like, I think most of us, uh, I would say probably everybody uh, agrees that like, you know, we find a need to get visibility into the system, then move on to like, you know, how we get insights from it and how we actually recommend things to people who are not like, you know, doing this like as a day job pretty much, right? To like improve the system. And finally, how do we get the systems to kind of improve themselves? So that's kind of the high level, um, um, I would say like the blocks of things. So it doesn't mean that really um, uh, these things need to happen in series, right? Like, you know, we can kind of start like, you know, phase two when phase one is happening, but it's kind of like, I would say the harder problems to solve are like, you know, coming further down. We're kind of pushing the can down the road. So uh, as like, you know, Alex said, right? Like, so uh, whether it has to be to Peter Drucker or like Lord Kelvin or whatever, right? You cannot improve what you can not measure. So I think the, uh, we have a long history of work in the field, uh, so IETF, like a, a, like IETF has done quite a bit of work, like you know NetMod, like you know Yang, like you know a whole bunch of stuff like that's happened in IETF. IRTF has done quite a bit of stuff and and doing stuff in NMRG. IAB has done like a lot of documents, like you know pro, uh, providing guidance in this thing. So we've been pretty successful uh, in in kind of standardizing like the things that need to get measured and how we measure them. 
And um, so we do this for management, like network management, for performance management, and for troubleshooting, right? Like, and, but I think we also need to start doing this for environmental impact. And of course, it's difficult to do, but the problem is like the, the longer we uh, delay doing this, uh, we're gonna like leave ourselves open to a lot of stuff happening outside the ITF, right? Which is kind of um, like lets you have um, stuff that's potentially redundant. So like different vendors are gonna do uh, different things. It's gonna be proprietary to them. And sometimes like people are gonna do like contradictory metrics as well, right? Like, you know, you really don't have uh, stuff that's well reconciled. So this is a problem in, in by itself, but for somebody who's using these things, if you have like very different things from different vendors and you have a multi-vendor network, it, it becomes very difficult to kind of have like an overall view of the system. So we really need to act quickly to do something that we can agree on and kind of set like industry level standards on on uh, what is going to get measured and how and, and and kind of terminology is like really part of it right like you know because people have different ways of measuring stuff so we kind of have to have precise ways uh, uh, on what things are what so the the next step is like kind of like have something for the industry to use right like and, and like this is just like a straw man proposal is that like we kind of have some kind of open source implementation right like for people to actually have the standardized metrics that we've uh, built and collected and, and 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 put them together in a way that people can actually see their uh, environmental impact so whether it's like energy efficiency like or like you know somehow translating this into carbon emissions or like whatever angle you want to see then to kind of visualize this thing so that's kind of the first step and um, so, of course, like, you know, this is not going to like this, of course, going to be some stuff that's common between um, like different network vendors and so on uh, and, and users. But like there's also we need a way to kind of customize this, right? Like so people can actually add some kind of value on top of it, because if it's just going to be uh, the lowest common denominator, it's probably not going to be enough for like a lot of the users. And uh, I think like Eve brought this up. Um, I think I don't know if it's like yesterday or like on Monday. Um, like this is like kind of a multi-domain problem at some point. And so if you have like similar ways of looking at stuff, it's at least there's, there's like a hope that you can actually kind of reconcile this across domains. But without that, we probably don't even have the same language you can speak across domains. So and of course, it's a very difficult problem, but at least we have a start in that direction. And, and the, uh, the next step would be to kind of provide some kind of advice, like, you know, is there any operational changes you can do? Can you like turn off specific routers at specific times? Is there like some um, um, transceivers that can get turned off, right? And is, is there like some equipment that can be replaced, like, you know, when it's getting close to its like design lifetime? So those kind of things can all be like recommendations coming from such kind of software uh, towards the people. So people can actually uh, plan for this and, and, and do, um, proactive changes and uh, like at, at, at the last step right like we kind of do this at a longer time scale so if it's going to be months or years like a human looking at it and, and providing solutions or looking at solutions and ordering stuff it's all going to work but at some point um, a human doing this is not going to cut it right so we can if you want to do something in a smaller time scale and we kind of have to start building uh, some amount of self-awareness into the network and uh, I know IRTF has some work ongoing, but it's not really in, in the space. But I think we can actually start looking at, uh, it, it, is there something we can actually do and, and probably make like small changes and, and, and have like a feedback loop, right? To see how um, the changes affect the system and kind of keep repeating this in, in small increments. And, and one key thing we see is like, this needs to be done in a declarative fashion. I don't think like people are gonna start doing this and say like, hey, like make my, I don't know, energy, effic energy efficiency stuff, like 93% or whatever. It's not really the um, the goal for somebody, right? Like people are gonna have to specify something in a higher level and using all the collected metrics, we kind of have some kind of machine learning algorithm that can go and look at uh, op opportunities to improve these things, right? And, and also like, you know, looking at like something called scope four, right? Scope four is like really avoided emissions. I think it was Jens who talked about it yesterday. Like, you know, the us meeting here online um, saves a lot of travel, that's like the scope four. So I think um, having some kind of uh, automated system is gonna help us um, look for opportunities in this uh, space to see like, you know, what kind of emissions that can be avoided in the future. So uh, just going uh, to closing, um, so we need to help our consumers of our technologies. I think a lot of them are on this call. So like when I say consumers, like I'm talking about like the IETF and, and the industry to kind of understand their emissions impact, like, you know, looking at scope three 
uh, for the vendor side and, and looking at a vendor agnostic standard is like very very important because it like we see a lot of stuff that's coming out in the market it's really greenwashing right like you know it's just um um uh, coming up with stuff to say, oh, like we are doing like amazing stuff, but not really um, substantive. So we kind of need to do something that's vendor agnostic and and and, and that's something that's like substantial to reduce uh, the environmental impact. Uh, another thing we can do, I think like uh, probably like uh, Alvar and Russ would cover it somehow uh, in their thing, like kind of looking at their paper. So like we kind of need to build robustness and recoverability into the protocols. So instead of doing unnecessary redundancy. So a lot of the times we have protocols which are like really over-engineered. They're like, you know, having like, you know, four links on standby, doing nothing uh, in, just in case things go wrong. I think like, you know, we kind of need to avoid stuff like that and build robustness and recoverability into the protocols. And, and also look at like, you know, how we meet SLAs in the more energy efficient way. So we don't need to really beat the SLAs all the time, but also look at like, you know, what is the, like I would say the least thing we can do to meet the SLAs. And, and finally, like, you know, kind of avoid micro optimizations and consider product life cycle. So like one of the things we kind of like realize is like, let's say a core router of today uh, could become like a, a edge router for tomorrow, right? Like if, if it's possible to have some of the functionality that's required for the edge router, that's not always there. So uh, what we kind of do, and we are engineers, like at least most of us are engineers, we try to optimize everything like very, very tightly to the use case and like, you know, we are proud of it. But I think at some point we need to look at the flexibility uh, so that like, you know, things can actually last longer and that provides like, you know, much more benefits in, in some cases than optimizing everything like very, very tightly for what can be done. And I know there's cases like where this doesn't really work. Like, you know, for example, Carson is doing a lot of stuff in IoT and like something that lasts like a year on a AA battery. Like those kind of things don't work, but at least like think about it when we design protocols. So that's pretty much it for my side. Thank you. Great, thank you. That was that was a terrific overview. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will, uh, unless somebody has their hand up and I'm not seeing it, um, we should uh, go to the next presentation and we will continue our discussion towards the end. And now we have a sort of a continuation of general thoughts and solutions and benefits. And I think, I'm not sure, is, Russ, are you gonna be presenting? Yes, terrific, thanks. Yes, I am, sorry, I have to unmute things and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so I only Russ, have like three or four slides. Um, is that- Do you want me to share or will you? Um, I should already be sharing, no? Okay, good, all right, Yes, great. and if you wanna go into full screen mode, that'd be great. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, hopefully it continues to share correctly. Looks great. All right. <clears throat> so this is based on a draft. Um, Alvaro and Manuel and I did a lot of work way, way back um, when about energy awareness and we approached things from a lot of different ways. Um, and one of which was to just reduce the amount of energy that is required by routing protocols. But we kind of walked away from that a little bit because we didn't, we weren't certain how much gain we would have there. So um, maybe keeping that in the back of your head as another <clears throat> possible optimization in the future, but not something I'm looking at right now. So what we did say is we said there are essentially three modes that we could think of that would be helpful. The first would be to reduce redundant links. For instance, I have two links right here. Perhaps I could get rid of one of those two. Um, I have two parallel paths here. Perhaps I could get rid of one of those two. <clears throat> and the second is removing redundant equipment. So for instance, if I could get rid of these two routers um, or power them down for some period of time or something like that, that would also reduce cost um, or reduce energy usage. Another is, has been talked about in the chat, is that you can actually reduce the speed of these links. If this is 100 gig, then you can potentially drop it um, you know, if you're using QAM and you're using, say, four channels of QAM over an optical link or something like that, or a, a wireless link, you might be able to reduce to 25 gig or something like that and reduce the power usage. Um, and all of these can be done in a time variant way. And I think that's an important point. Um, but now let's look at some of the strict routing protocols things. Now, I'm not going to talk again a lot about um, equipment. 
because equipment is problematic in that the more you bring something down and pull it back up, the more often it is to um, the more the more often it's going to fail. And so you just have to think about the trade offs in the equipment failure versus how often you're bringing it up and down, just like a light bulb. In reality, the more often you turn it on and off, the quicker the light bulb goes out. So there are things that we need to look at there and try to understand. Um, I would argue that we don't know the answers to these questions right now because we haven't done a lot of measurement in this area to understand, like, if I shut a router off 15 times in a day versus never, what is the uptime going to be? But thinking about strictly from a control plane perspective, just thinking about some of the impacts that we have. For instance, let's say if this left is my <coughs> bandwidth and this right is my energy usage, then I can say, oh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, I can say, okay, well, you know what? I think I did this one backwards, by the way. I think this is one four. But anyway, um, I could say, you know what? I could save a lot of energy by cutting this link out. But when I cut that link out, I'm driving traffic up through this upper path. This increases what we call stretch, which is simply the number of hops in the, in the network itself. And the thing is, is that every hop that you clock off optics and into electronics and off electronics onto optics, when you do these serialized, deserialized steps, you are adding delay to the network and you are potentially adding jitter to the network because um, here, first of all, you have just the simple, I'm switching from this path to this path, which is gonna cause a routing protocols convergence, which causes jitter. Um, what the application sees as jitter as the traffic shifts from one path to the other path. The second thing is, as I push more traffic onto this path, these queues, um, if I have very carefully tuned my quality of service and I'm using traffic engineering or traffic steering to make sure that the network is optimal. So for instance, let's say that I push all my video traffic this way and all my voice traffic this way, and then I kill this path for energy savings. I'm now mixing video and voice in the same queue structure, which is much more difficult to do um, and not have lots of things like that. So you decrease aggregate bandwidth, you're, you're increasing stretch, you're potentially increasing jitter, um, you can be increasing delay. And so these can all have a negative impact on applications. So the whole point here is not that we shouldn't do any of this stuff. The point is we need to think about it and figure out how to do this stuff rationally and where it makes sense and where it might not make sense. Um, it may be that in some cases, shutting down a particular set of links might save us energy but, you know, again, we may not know um, whether that's going to work or not. <clears throat> so problems that we definitely need to solve are out and in service determination. So I need to decide when I should take a link or piece of equipment out of, out of commission for energy savings. I need to know what that looks like when I bring it back up. Um, I need to know how I'm going to determine to bring it back up. Um, and this is true also for even things with um, uh, short-term sleeps, like micro-sleeps and stuff like that, which we've talked about in the past, to solve some of these problems is to do micro-sleeps, to say, okay, I really don't think I have traffic for you for the next second, so let's shut down this link for the next second, and you come back up and check with me in a second. Um, these kind of micro-sleep ideas um, have been around for a long time. Um, whether or not, you know, how you determine to do that. Another thing is, we often don't think about this, is that, Routing protocols rely on being able to pass traffic through the link to remember that the link is there and to know that the link is there and to know what's reachable past that link. Um, <clears throat> so we need to think about from a routing perspective, control plane perspective, how do I remember that link is there? How do I remember what's reachable via that link? How do I handle things? that change in reachability while the link is asleep or down or the device is down or asleep and what do i do with those things now i'll say that this part of things will probably be covered in the tvr working group that's coming up right now in fact i have a meeting this afternoon to talk about next steps in the tvr boff so that is something that we need to think about another thing is uh, that there's work kind of going in that area the next is convergence impact so when i converge bgp First of all, um, since BGP is the big kid on the block nowadays, 
Um, first of all, I have hunt. I have the potential of all sorts of just not converging. Whether or not people believe this, the internet core never converges. Um, never ever converges. So you have hunt, you have not converging, you have all sorts of weird things that can happen if you're looking at something like IS to IS, which is a link state protocol. Um, then you have micro loops, and these things have an impact on drop packets and things like that, and jitter and delay in the network. And so you need to think through, like, how do we make sure that we're not dropping packets and impacting application performance? Or do we not care in some cases? There are some applications that don't care about drop packets. And that's cool. That's great. Um, but we need to think about those things. And we need to try to understand how to make the control plane aware of all that stuff and do the right thing. Um, and finally, impact on fast convergence. So, um, you know, a lot of parallel links and redundancy is just there to converge more quickly in the case of failure. And so how do we, if we put something to sleep or we take it offline to save energy, how do we anticipate failure or how do we deal with it? And what do we do about the fast convergence situations? Um, so these are all things that um, just need to be thought about. Again, not saying we shouldn't do any of this, just trying to point out or try to figure out some of the places where work needs to be done and um, how you know, where we can do or where we might, what we might want to do to try to solve some of these things um, and some of the work that's been done in the past. So hopefully that is useful from the perspective um, of stuff. So I see Torless said, in data centers, you always have an out of band network. Well, that's true in some data centers and it's not true in other data centers. Um, some data centers have gone just for port count problems to an inbound network. Um, so it's not consistent. Uh, let's see. Someone else said, um, yes, exactly, constraint-based optimization. And as I said earlier in the chat, one thing to remember is that optimizing for two metrics, like bandwidth and energy usage, is technically MP-complete. You can do it, but you've got to merge the metrics somehow. You can't actually run shortest path first or even BGP. Part of the reason BGP is, is by stable is because we try to optimize on multiple metrics. And when you do that, you end up in a non-atomic um, state where order of operation makes a difference and things are gone um, or hard. Um, yeah, so um, any questions or thoughts beyond uh, what I've just tossed out here? I appreciate it. Right, and there's this very rich conversation going on in the text, so much so that I finally stopped looking at it because I really wanted to listen to your talk. Um, so uh, if there are people who feel that their question has not been answered, um, please jump in. Okay. That was fascinating, Russ. Especially given your, um, you know, the, the level of detail to which you understand the landscape within the ITF and what's actually going on with, with routing. So um, that was really instructive, although I can't say that I understood all of the acronyms, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to drill into your paper uh, in hopes of finding some of that. Um, okay, let us move on to the next presentation. And the next presentation should be on data formats. So um, uh, I'm not sure if, Bre if Brendan or Karsten, one, one of you um, will be. There you go. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it looks like I have a minor glitch with um, uh, needing to have uh, WebEx have permissions to actually share. So I might have to do a quick rejoin here. Okay. Karsten, are you on? Are you able to present? Well, we'll wait for you to return. I'm not sure whether I should uh, propose that we do the multicasting casting first because uh, then we'll okay. talk the remaining two hours about multicast, but maybe you should do that. <laughs> okay, we can do that. Okay. Yes, so do you see me? Hi. Yes, we do. Hi. Uh, I'll try to share my screen then. Okay, so do you see the slides? We see the screen. We see the, um, it's not in presentation mode just as yet, but we do see, there you go. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, 
So uh, just first, so I'm a, a second year PhD student uh, in Belgium at UC Louvain. Uh, so maybe uh, my presentation will be like a bit too much uh, research oriented, but I hope that we will have some interesting conversation after one. So the the paper in the position of the paper, we just wanted to reconsider multicast because um, we had problems with multicast, uh, and now we think maybe uh, thanks to the energy impact we have uh, with multicast, it may be interesting to reconsider at least for some uh, applications and some networks. So just I'm pretty sure you almost know what is multicast, but to be sure that we are on the same page, a uh, quick reminder. Uh, with multicast, you avoid sending multiple times the same data in the network. So, um, sorry, okay. So, for example, uh, here imagine that this router wants to send the same data to routers one, two, and four. With unicast, you will send separately the data to each receiver. So, um, you have multiple times the same data flowing in the network uh, on some links, for example, the first one and the second one. But with multicast, you only send uh, the packet once uh, in the network, and then the routers um, will duplicate this data um, to reach all the re receivers of the network. So there are currently some applications that use multicast, uh, for example, uh, still IPTV and stop ex exchange, but we think it may be interesting to reconsider multicast for other applications. For example, here, the, the, the conference we, we just have now, it may be interesting to reconsider multicast if we could deploy it uh, in the wide array network, for example. So. In the positional paper, what we did um, was that we wanted to uh, practically show how multicast um, is more efficient than unicast. So we made an emulation of the Geo network, which is uh, composed of 22 routers and 36 links. links. And we, we just sent um, some dummy traffic from uh, the source to an increasing number of, uh, of receivers. And for that, we, we compared unicast and multicast. And the multicast for a mechanism we used was the bit index explicit replication protocol, uh, so beer in short, uh, because we have an implementation uh, of it which is open source. Um, and for simplification, we just ignored the uh, communication setup. So we just imagined that uh, every receiver uh, already made some multicast join in the multicast case and uh, already set up the, the traffic. Uh, in um, for the unicast case. So the, the first thing we, of course, we, we know it, uh, is that multicast reduces the bytes uh, footprints uh, because as we avoid sending multiple times the same packets um, in the network, uh, when you start increasing really much the number of receivers, uh, sorry for the noise, um, we avoid sending multiple times the same packets uh, on some links. So here we see that when we increase uh, the number of receivers uh, above seven, for example, uh, we start having, sorry, I just, I'm sorry. Um, we will just send fewer bytes uh, on the network um, compared to unicast, which is more linearly because when you increase, uh, when you add a new receiver, you will, um, send uh, individually this packet to the new receiver, as we saw before. Uh, the second thing we analyzed uh, was the number of CPU cycles uh, on the source, because with multicast, you only send the packet once, um, compared to, mul sorry, with multicast, you send the packet only once, once compared to unicast, when, where um, you must send an additional packet every time you have a new receiver. Uh, so here with multicast, uh, we have uh, no increase when we change the number of receiver, of course. Um, and this is um, this will be more important uh, when you consider, for example, protected payloads because well, with unicast you must encrypt uh, separately the payload each time you want to send to a new receiver. But, but with multicast you could only encrypt it once and then send it to the network. So the the, the, the question uh, that we, we we have now is that multicast works well in theory, um, but why isn't it more deployed to today? And basically, when I was doing my research, the, the question was the, because of this paper, because what it showed basically is that with multicast, we have issues everywhere uh, and it's really difficult to deploy it. So in the positional paper, uh, we reviewed three of these issues um, and tried to find some possible solutions. Uh, of course, this is an open discussion. So. Um, you might not agree, and I will be happy to discuss uh, the, to discuss it with you. So, 
For example, the first issue was that IP multicast, which was the, the first major deployment of multicast, uh, required states uh, on the routers for each multicast group uh, in the network. So some papers, for example, the doctor multicast paper show that when you start increasing too much the number of groups, you might see packet losses because um, because the routers cannot handle all that state um, caused by the multicast uh, groups. So the first work uh, which has been standardized uh, in 2017 by the IETF was to provide a kind of stateless uh, multicast for ending mechanism uh, called uh, beer. So I talked a bit earlier about beer um, and it's not widely deployed, but theoretically it's really interesting because you, you, you don't have this state on the routers and you can only you, this state is now uh, embedded inside the packet, so you can scale to an increasing number of multicast groups. The second issue, um, and I think it's not discussed very much uh, in the community, but it's that 20 years ago, when you wanted to deploy a new protocol, uh, it had to be in the kernel. Um, because, because of the performance gap we had between user space and kernel space, um, we, we had to deploy them in the kernel, but it was really a burden to um, to implement new protocols in the kernel, and that's why we 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 stay and we stay with TCP for such a long time. But now in 2022, this performance gap decreased, um, and so now it might be interesting to reconsider uh, deploying new protocols, uh, new multicast protocols, on top of um, uh, an IP multicast forwarding or a beer forwarding, for example, because. A simple example is the Creek protocol, which is implemented in user space, but it's widely deployed, uh, of course, because of Google, but it's widely, it's been widely deployed and it only works in user space. So now we can build these new protocols and not have the burden to deploy them in the kernel. So they are also more easy to, um, to extend. The final issue we briefly discussed in the paper, and I'm not an expert in that uh, right now. So, um, it's open to discussion and I know it's a tricky one, but uh, it's almost impossible currently to deploy multicast um, in the wide array network because of the interdomain policies. Um, what we thought uh, in the paper was that maybe we can think about multicast overlay networks, uh, for example, using CDNs as multicast relays, um, because now these CDNs are almost everywhere in the world. So we can build a new multicast overlay network on top of it. Uh, more easily compared to uh, before. So there were there are other issues that were that we briefly talked about in the paper. So for example, the data encryption uh, in dynamic groups. So imagine that you want to have a protected um, traffic between the source and the receivers. Um, what happens when someone leaves the group because you only you have a shared key between the source and the receivers. And if someone wants to leave this group, you have to find a way to efficiently um to efficiently forward a new key to the remain to the um, to, to the receivers that remain in the group uh, without sending this key to the um, to the living uh, receiver so there are some um some possibilities there were some solutions that were proposed um but it's still i think an open research problem also when we want to uh, make some multicast traffic for example for software updates which is um, an interesting idea but you want to be sure that every receiver correctly received the data um, and there, there, there isn't any packet loss. But imagine that you are in a kind of a lossy network or you have some bunch of receivers in the last hop, for example, uh, of the last of a uh, rotor in the multicast tree. Uh, you must have a mechanism to ensure that the data was correctly received and or for them to tell to the sender that the data was lost. So, we have what we call the ACK or NAC implosion in real-world multicast um, because we need the system to say that we received or not the data. And it can be a problem uh, on the source um, to receive too much of these acknowledgements. The third issue, and maybe it's one of the trickiest also, is that you, have, you want to have in some situations a source authentication um, mechanism to ensure that the correct sender sent the data uh, to the receivers and that's you know you don't have someone in the group having access to the shared key which can be also used to encrypt data um, sending fake data to the network and uh, floating for example uh, the receivers uh, with this fake data 
So to conclude, I, I would say that, of course, multicasting is complex and we see that we have a lot of issues that are not, that do not exist with unicast, but I think it's worth the effort because I, I discussed briefly in the paper and I think it's the, the common consensus. We have this trade-off between simplicity of deployment and maintenance, maintenance with unicast versus the efficiency of multicast forwarding. And for the past decades, we only wanted to make, um, to have simplicity. Uh, and so that's why we removed almost everywhere multicast uh, and deployed unicast solutions with uh, CDNs. But now in this more energy efficient um, desire uh, networks, it's time maybe to reconsider it and, re and reconsider having efficient networks. And if you don't, I think it's an issue, but I, I mean, all of us think it's maybe an issue. Um, just recall that during the coronavirus crisis, um, the, the French government, but apparently also in the rest of Europe, but the French government asked Netflix to reduce the video quality uh, of their uh, series and film just to release the pressure on the network. So I don't say that we must uh, do multicast for Netflix, but just to say that um, congestion in today's networks can also happen when you have a lot of people using the networks. And even without that, we know that multicast is um, a more energy efficient um, mechanism. So in an energy, if, if you want to reduce the energy uh, footprint, uh, I think it may be very important to reconsider it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um... And thank you for uh, getting us up to date on what has transpired in the multicast landscape, um, since it is something that has been um, very much discussed for at least a couple decades or more within the ITF, discussed, advanced, progressed. Um, so it's great to see that your uh, thesis work is uh, in this area. Um, and uh, I wondered, you know, at the very beginning of this session, I don't know, Pascal, are you still here? Um, you had made a question about um, on protocol designs, um, add to the list of protocols to evaluate, you know, so in the very first uh, presentation, there was discussion about, well, what should we be looking at? Um, Pascal, I don't know if you want to state in your own, uh, if you want to expand on your comment here, Add to the list the use of broadcast and reactive protocols. Would you like to expand oh, yeah. on that? Yes, thank you, Eve. Um, yeah, th there was there was the presentation by Tolus uh, on the first day of this workshop, where uh, one of the items was the work that the ITF has been doing over pretty much the last decade on uh, energy savings in protocols, and probably the, the place where this happened the most is. Uh, the IoT community, because a lot of those protocols were, are designed to operate on battery. And effectively, we have already designed uh, routing protocols, which incorporate some routing stretch to save um, energy and state in the devices. And for instance, uh, interestingly enough, one of the design points uh, for, for the Ripple protocol was that the control could never exceed the data. And that's, that's an interesting constraint if you look at it. Uh, but, but it was there and we had to, to cope with this and, and that the, de the design of the routing protocol was impacted by this. Um, another uh, aspect that I have in mind that we, we took a lot of care uh, about in the IoT groups was the use of broadcast on radios. Because it's been said a lot that um, the, the, the energy consumption does not depend much on traffic. It depends on the peak usage or peak capability. Well, that's that's mostly true on wires. On wireless, um, it's a lot less true. And effectively, we see different stages, and, and we, we measured that to the macro column, actually. Um, we, we see that there is a, a very low power state of the device where it can only be awakened, and there is a, a processor-only state of the device. Then when the radio is on, there is a big peak of uh, energy consumption. I'm talking about small IoT devices here. And then when the, the device is, is uh, transmitting or, or receiving data, then there is another uh, um, big peak of, of uh, energy consumption. So you really see in which stage uh, of energy consumption you are. And we, we figured in particular that to save energy, we had to avoid 
um, as much as we could the use of, of broadcast. Um, and that's why we designed the uh, six loop and, and the uh, variant and of ND to, to avoid those, those things. So that's what I had in mind, basically saying, hey, when we look at protocol, protocol designs, effectively, you can think them with energy in mind or not. And it, it's, we, we also did what Russ said, by the way, this, this idea of having a composite metric. We, Ripple works with uh, what we call an objective function, which is a composite metric. And effectively, we wanted to incorporate power. I mean, it's just an option that you can do in this context. So, so I'm fully in line with uh, everything that Russ said, by the way. And, and mm -hmm. yes, we have some experience at the IETF, and we would gladly share that and, and possibly expand you know, the use of our designs uh, outside of, of the IoT community. Right. Okay. Um, there were, I, I was hoping that the kind of the discussion about broadcast and multicast um, were sort of uh, complementary and, um, you know, shared some spirit of how do we get to efficiency. So that was why I returned to your question. Oh, um, okay. So it's, it's, slightly, yeah. it's slightly related. It's just that basically if you want to keep devices with in with low power you cannot have them expect data at any point of time they, they must be allowed to sleep which means that while they sleep they cannot expect data so you have to design with that in mind um so that that's kind of complementary with multicast because if you start still doing multicast that means that you have to have some some idea of the schedule the way you schedule your multicast so the device can remain asleep so yes there, there is an intersection okay Thank you. Um, I saw that there was another question here about CDNs that may or may not have been answered. Um, is it Yari? Uh, it's a great observation that CDNs might help with the interdomain issues we previously had, but isn't there also a different impact? If we have a CDN node in a DSL ISP, for instance, we have a limited savings potential. Um, maybe that got answered. There was some discussion about uh, business incentives for the CDMs to do this, and uh, if they have right. that or not, then. And um, so I, I think the follow-on question was where I was headed. Was um, Dom's question was why would CDMs reduce their revenue from Unicast? Maybe they wouldn't maybe. necessarily, it would just depend on what the business model looks like and stuff. Like, do you, um, can the CDN build a business model about it's going to around it to make money doing multicast is going to depend on market forces more than it is the CDN's design largely. I, I mean, if, if somebody give, if somebody, if somebody were to come to Akamai, for instance, and say, we want to give you X amount of multicast traffic, and um, we want you to distribute for us in a multicast way, and you know we're going to pay you X amount of money, and that seemed like a good deal. We would figure out a way to do it. That's my that's my I mean, um, big checks make things happen. I don't know that anybody's done such a thing yet. I think that's that's kind of a thing. <laughs> it strikes me that there's another lever here. Um, and what it looks like to me is that this is a, an opportunity for ISPs to improve their peering agreements, right? If you've got an ISP that's distributing roughly the same content at roughly the same time to a whole lot of users, then they've got an opportunity to pair with a CDN and improve their peering agreements as a result of the reduced traffic that they have upstream. So I, I'm not sure if it's it's a question of the CDNs themselves having the right incentives. I think that there is sort of a hybrid of an ISP and a CDN, where if you put those two things together, suddenly you do have those incentives. And um, I think kind of back to Yari, I, I think while I was calling out your question, I was trying to find it in this uh, list of uh, wonderful conversation back and forth was, you know, what's the business reason? Um, and one of the business reasons could be what we just heard about, um, uh, which is, you know, from Luis, which is uh, there's energy efficiency to be had. And the more that that becomes a differentiator, maybe this is, you know, at least this is what occurred to me was maybe the CDNs use that and market that 
um, and that then allows them to adopt uh, whatever technologies, whether it's multicast or something else, that um, allows them to claim that, and not just claim, but quantif allows them to quantify how much they're saving by using these other techniques. So that might be kind of an interesting thing that I anticipate developing. Martin has his hand up. As someone who's worked for Akamai for over a decade, I, I can say that um, I've never heard a philosophical objection to multicast inside the company. Uh, um, it's just that uh, the arrangement of the way things work solves uh, a lot of the business problems and the problems on the client end. And as I typed into the chat, a lot of our the CDN contracts are based on things like gigabytes delivered to clients. So if, if it could be accomplished with some blend of multicast and unicast or something like that, um, I think that would, you know, that would be fine. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the way that streaming kind of played out makes it on demand and unpredictable. If it was more like traditional television, where, you know, if HBO or Netflix said, hey, the show starts at 9 p.m. in this time zone, um, it would be easier to kind of take one take one's mind technically to try to use things like multicast. Um, there's also a lot of DRM and rights things that kick in. Um, and uh, the, 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 the parts about encryption in the presentation were interesting to me. Great. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions here? I had forgotten that we had swapped the <laughs> the orders <laughs> and it was sort of feeling we had opened things up to the floor. So uh, let's return to the previous talk. Um, and uh, now that you have rejoined, let's, let's see if we can get the slides. Thank you. Oh, I think we've got it. Terrific. Go ahead. So, um, Suresh and and uh, one of the other speakers gave me an excellent lead in here. Um, there was some discussion about the, uh, you know, Suresh mentioned that Karsten has been working on uh, IoT devices that last for a year on a battery. And, uh, and I believe Pascal also mentioned working constrained networks. Um, I think that's a great lead in because ultimately what we're talking about here is a new constraint. We're talking about an energy constraint on our network, and that's just another kind of constrained network. So the question that we have is essentially how much can we steal from uh, constrained network technologies and apply to constrained energy networks? So um, with, with that in mind, we, uh, we started with encoding. So d the first question is, does it matter? Is this, is this worth doing at all? Um, if the difference that we get out of encoding things differently is small, then maybe there's no point. Um, well, it really, it depends what kind of data we're encoding. That turns out to be the most important part of this. So text encodes, encodes into text formats well, as expected, but everything else encodes poorly. Um, binary data gets you a 33% inflation. Integers are usually around 50. Floating point it can range from not much to huge. Um, there's, you know, structures are, are also bad. And I think I just saw something in the chat about security and encodings. Yes, I'm personally, I really dislike Jose from a security perspective. Encoding binary um, objects into JSON just seems risky to me in a secure format. Um, but that's just me. Um, so really, there is, it turns out there is an impact, but we need to quantify exactly how big it is. So what we did to try and work out exactly what we're dealing with is to take a series of CenML uh, examples. Now, CenML is a sensor, uh, sensor measurement list 
uh, RFC. And the idea here is that we want to get some data that's representative of non text things that are being transferred and encoded in either JSON or CBOR. Uh, can you still see my slides or did they just disappear? They just disappeared. Okay, one moment. Let's get those back. Right. We wanted something that was encoded in both JSON and CBOR. Um, the idea here being that we can actually show the difference between a common text encoding and a common binary encoding. So SetML was a great option because it actually has both of those already, and we can encode either way uh, with, with relative ease. This let us uh, do this, uh, this chart, which gives you an idea of roughly how much uh, data is used by each of these examples. Now, the examples themselves aren't that interesting for, for this audience. Really, the more important question here is what kind of size reductions can we see? And they fluctuate a bit, but they're often a fair bit better than, than a third. So we can save a third of data if we encode it properly. Now, I mean, how does this play into, into overall internet traffic? Well, if the majority of the internet's traffic is, is in, taken up by video, this isn't going to move the needle uh, because really that comes down to video compression more than anything else. And what we're talking about here is, well, it's compression. Um, we're just, you know, an encoding difference can be a compression. So then the next question is, how does this impact energy? So if there's no real difference between uh, energy for uh, text encoding and energy for binary encoding, then there's not much point in continuing this. So let's have a look and see if we can quantify it a little bit. Now this came up, something related to this came up earlier on the list, talking about always on capacity versus um, you know, data dependent capacity. And a lot of the discussion that's gone on so far has been centered around wired networks. But the question I would ask is how many people are using exclusively wired networks in their homes. Individual energy use from network traffic is probably largely Wi-Fi, except in a business context. So that, to me, suggests that we should be looking at wireless technologies as well. Certainly in the data center and in backhaul, we need to consider the, uh, the other uh, side of things, the wired side. But the point here is that the, the last step is almost always wireless, and that's where this matters. Now, I'm not modeling Wi-Fi here, I'm modeling with LoRa, and the reason for choosing LoRa in this, uh, in this talk is because LoRa has some really convenient time on air calculations that makes it very easy to estimate the energy use. Um, so LoRa is a pretty good example. It's also a widely deployed I, IoT network, which gives us some, some good guesses on how things will work. Um, so the results of, of, of this model are that we get, you know, often 30% or better energy savings by, by doing this. And one of the interesting aspects of using a low power WAN is that the, the send and receive energy is actually quite a large portion of the device's energy budget. Uh, that turns out to be on the order of millijoules, as you can see in the graph quite regularly. And those, uh, that's a, a substantial portion of the, data, the, the device's battery lifetime. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the, in the paper, but you can see that the consumption of the devices actually turns out to be measured in you know, roughly thousands of messages. So this, this turns out to be an important thing to, to quantify. We can look at the, the device's lifetime in, in months for, you know, hourly messages and things like that. So it strikes me that this is an important consideration. Um, there are some interesting effects that we found, like the, that the overhead of setting up a packet actually substantially reduces the impact on short messages. Larger messages are less affected. Um, and this is mostly because of the, the messages in LoRa are quantized to 127 bytes. Um, right, so uh, there are some, some substantial impacts that we get from, the, uh, from the, the energy reduction. It means you can have smaller batteries. That means devices can have longer life, and, and that's a, a question of both cost and e-waste. Um, you can use smaller energy harvesting systems. 
and the devices themselves can be lower cost. So this has a social justice and a, uh, an environmental justice aspect to it as well by reducing the, we as the IETF could potentially make devices cheaper by making their encodings smaller. So we have a couple of choices in the IETF. Um, JSON and Seabor seem very common for hierarchical data formats as of today. So um, we get a lot of myths on text formats when we discuss them. I've seen, these these are quotes I have seen from people in, in IETF discussions. So uh, this is, is not, um, and, and this is, you know, this year I have had these discussions. So this is definitely an ongoing debate. Um, people think that it's easier to debug JSON than it is to debug Seabor. And in my experience, this is not directly true. There are many tools to help you debug Seabor. On top of that, we get uh, a lot of uh, discussions about, I don't need to install a tool to look at JSON. Well, you know, you can decode Seabor in a web browser. So that also is not directly a, uh, as, as realistic of a problem as it seems at first. Um, but there's some unpleasant truths here. These are decisions that we make as engineers, and they're actually tooling pro problems, not encoding problems. The vast majority of the data that we send isn't for us as people debugging the protocol. It's actually for a machine to interpret. So when we make decisions as, the, as members of the IETF to pick a format that's easy for us to debug, we are actually incurring a long lasting cost for the entire world to bear that we just to make our lives a little bit easier during debugging. We need to plan for the primary use case of our data formats rather than planning for what makes our lives easier in debugging. And that means we need to focus on machine interpretation and constrained energy in our networks. So there are a number of benefits to binary encodings. I'm sure I don't need to convince everyone, but I'll just run through it anyway. Um, they're simple to parse, which means we have lower embodied energy in our devices due to lower code overhead and lower memory. And we have lower active energy. There's less compute overhead in order to actually uh, interpret the data. There's less per character work, for, for example, escaping and delimiting. And we have less redundant conversion work, converting something to base 64 to transfer it over a network in order to convert it back to binary just makes very little sense. Um, a lot of decimal conversion as well. And then because the, our, our data format is smaller, we spend less energy in transmit and receive, assuming it's a wireless network. Um, there's lower interpretation complexity as well. If the uh, complexity for decoding the format is lower, that means that the security posture of your system is also simpler. And we end up with more deterministic encodings, which is good from a security perspective as well, um, largely due to white space and escaping choices, but also due to a few other interesting properties that you'll find in JSON decoders. So we have some recommendations that we want to bring to the IAB. Um, first off, I think that we need to consider content and intended use for data representation formats. So configuration formats, for example, text formats make sense. If you have primarily text content, then text formats are appropriate. But if you have primarily non-text content, we should be preferring form binary formats. Now, this isn't a game changer for eImpact. This is a small contribution, but it's also part of an ongoing trend where more and more formats are indeed moving to binary encoding. And there are examples uh, towards this. For example, HTTP2 is, uh, is now supporting binary encodings as well. So um, that's most of what I've got to say. Um, I, I see there's a lot going on in the chat. If anyone would like to, I, I obviously haven't followed it. So if anyone would like to, to bring questions, I'd be happy to talk more about this. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. Um, very enlightening. 
Um, there was uh, one of the questions that got raised, and uh, and again, you know, it's a little bit off topic, but it's, I mean, you you're sort of speaking to methodology, not just the specifics of Jason yeah. versus Jason versus Seabor, but um, you know, uh, Alex asks the question, how about the energy impact of rust versus non-rust, and the need to continuously transfer all that state. Trade off with the need to maintain state at the server, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if um, I, I know that you and Karsten also are involved in um, some of that effort. So if you have some thoughts there. Um, well, Karsten more so than I, so I yes, would invite yes. him to jump in on that one. So if you want me to talk about rest, um, that's maybe a different discussion. Uh, but it's also an interesting one because uh, rest, of course, is something that that came from the uh, big web, which which never has been particularly interested in in uh, conserving energy, uh, and it has been more interested in actually providing scalability, and it, it's one of the major scalability uh, tools we have there. Now, the the interesting thing about rest is that it's really something that that describes um, the transfer layer. And you always can push up things into the application layer if, if the transfer layer is not doing the right thing for you. So in, in many real world REST exchanges, we actually establish application state to avoid having to send the same data again and again and again. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see if we have pockets where, where that actually doesn't work very well or, or could be um, exploited uh, to, to get uh, better um better efficiency in the web this has been uh, has uh, been not very popular because it really makes load balancing uh, very hard but of course not all of our communication needs to be load balanced and Tarlis is saying thanks that was the answer to the rest question uh, to Torlis's point um, about uh, putting things the other way around that we need to build the diagnostic framework out a lot more um, my experience in working with Seabor has been that the diagnostic framework is actually quite a lot built out already. Just not being aware of the availability of those, di uh, of those diagnostic tools may be the issue. And so maybe there's an awareness problem that we have. But I would still argue that within the IETF, we have an obligation to consider the impacts of the protocols and formats that we design and that i mean that is what this whole thing is about i'm not suggesting sunsetting protocols what i am suggesting is that as we build out new protocols we need to stop looking at the network as an infinite resource that we can inflate unnecessarily to make our lives easier and this also speaks to um maybe uh, what vesno has been raising which is we already have security consideration sections in our drafts. What about sustainability? Is this kind of analysis something that um, should be required, um, not just in the latter stages of the draft development, but from the get-go? I think that's a great idea. I think discussing why encoding choices are made in uh, protocol documents and in format specifications is a great plan uh, because if, that reaches a stage at the IAB or at the IESG rather when the, the the review is done on an RFC and it says well we chose a text format because it was easier to look at in notepad then the IESG has an opportunity to go back and say well that's not really how we do things anymore and actually you said something I that really struck a nerve with me which is um when we write down, you know, how we solve solutions, if we explain the why we made the decisions we made, like a lot of that, um, unless it's captured in an email archive, you know, that doesn't necessarily make it into a spec. So maybe some of this would be forced to be put into a spec, um, forced as in, you know, encouraged by having um, at least some section of the draft that um, uh, uh, encourages the authors to to talk about efficiencies in with with a lens towards sustainability yeah so i think one sorry Yari, i see you have your hand raised but let me just quickly answer to that um i think we we need to stop um 
just uh, taking certain default choices uh, for granted. So why are people using JSON for protocol Y? Uh, well, because it's popular and has been used for protocol X. And um, I think that that's fine. And uh, in the history of the IETF, we, we always have had those attractive protocols that, that attract energy. So when, when I was still working in the context of SIP, of course, every everything had to be done over SIP because SIP was the attractive protocol of the day. And uh, at least in data representation, JSON definitely is an attractive protocol. And there are good reasons uh, for that. And that was one of the reasons why, why we copied most of JSON for, for Zebra to make sure we can generate the, the, the same attraction. Uh, but uh, it, it's a little bit like, uh, why are you flying to this conference and not taking the train? Uh, well, everybody is flying to that conference, so why, why should I not uh, do that? And I think we, we need to take the small step um, just just thinking about uh, considerations like that. And this is not about just about JSON or CBOS, so using HTTP2 instead of HTTP11 has exactly the same advantages. Yari, would you like to share your question? Yeah, and I also wrote, wrote it in the chat, but... Um... Basically, I was just wondering, I mean, th this is obviously uh, very sensible and we, we should definitely do this and, and your argument is well, well taken. But I, I was curious if we had uh, data on where in the internet with what parts of tech or what applications we might have biggest issues with regards to the bloated formats. Do, do we actually know that? And if we do know that, could we quantify how much we would save and not as a percentage of in this protocol, but sort of more more on a global basis, I understand that for a particular IoT deployment, for instance, the battery uh, lifetime impact would be massive and and very very much needed, and that that's a reason to do it. But on a global scale, maybe the web protocols, uh, and but on the other hand, they're kind of moving a little bit towards binary with H two. Um, so what are we talking about? How much could we save? Is this going to make a dent? So, I mean, this is going to be highly protocol dependent, but you can take Jose versus Jose as one example, because both of them are getting a fair bit of deployment. Um, and that, I, I mean, most of the, the issue I have with Jose is that it has um, base64 encoding. And so from that directly, you can see that there's a one third savings. Um, without even going into the rest of the the encoding questions, you get a one third savings directly because Jose uses uh, base sixty four encoding and Seaboard uses a plain binary representation. So uh, from that, in in authentication uh, or or encryption formats that are based on Jose, switching to Seaboard saves you a third. Uh, and that's probably a minimum because there are a few inflated th uh, there are a few other inflated bits and pieces. Um, I think that's probably the uh, the relevant part. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah but I, I guess what I was looking for is like how how often are these things used, and like yeah. am I using them every second, or is every every one of my voice packets on this call using that, or? Yeah, um, so this is this is the, the point I was trying to make earlier when I, I said that the vast majority of the traffic on the internet, as I understand it today, is done via um, done via video traffic, right? That's that's where the majority of it goes, and video traffic is already highly optimized for you know a lot of reasons. Um, but if you want another data point, there's a lot of email that goes around. And email is MIME encoded, and MIME is base64 whenever it encounters something that's not ASCII. So that being the case, you still get that one-third inflation. Um, it's, the, it's actually the same one. So that being the case, if we looked at email, then switching to uh, a hypothetical um, CBOR-based email representation of MIME, uh, or sorry, CBOR-based representation of MIME, uh, you would save a third. Okay, that's a good example. Thank you. Uh, so it's, it's Rob Wilton here. I was going to ask a question. I don't know if it's for you, Brendan, or for Carsten. 
Um, one of the differences between, say, using JSON and CBOR is really about how you encode the identifiers that, of what a particular yeah. field means. You have a choice of whether to use a string, which is always human readable, or you numerical identifier that can be converted to a string in some manner by some lookup table somewhere. Well, how far are you proposing we push this? Are you proposing we should use those string identifiers, we should use numerical identifiers, or, or is that not something you you looked at in terms of because I think that makes a difference to how easy it is to debug it, decode it. Can I see the names? Do I have to do some conversion? How easy, how easy it is to use those tools? Yeah, so I've thought about this a lot, and um, I think there is actually one missing tool. Um, and what that tool would be uh, is a, a web based decoder for these things where you can stick the CDDL, which defines your CBOR structure, into the decoder along with data that you expect to match it. And I don't think that's a big step because all of those tools, as far as I understand it, are available today, just not joined up together and available on the web. So this isn't a big stretch. Um, it's definitely doable. Um, and the direction I would push it, uh, since I come from the constrained node world, is all numeric identifiers. Because if you need to validate that structure, then you're going to need its data representation or its um, it's data modeling language representation anyway, so you might as well save the size. So, so then my question would be is for those cases, then if you've got to get the schema anyway to decode it, it would you be better off using one of the even tighter binary encodings like GPB, where it has to have the schema to decode the data and gets even tighter? I mean, so there's a trade off here between yeah. how tightly you compress it. And I like, I like uh, Seaborg because it feels to me like it's a good compromise between you can still decode it without requiring the schema, uh, and yet it's still quite a lot tighter than, than say, JSON is. So I think there's yeah. a trade off there. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I don't know exactly how far to push that. And that's something that I would encourage each you know, RFC author to consider carefully, You know, which, which direction they want to go with that. Um, I can see an argument on extremely constrained nodes that it's useful to, to do, use that schema approach. Um, but at the same time, there's uh, an element where maybe that's not the right thing in each application. Maybe uh, you know, having a generic hierarchical structure like Seabor is more appropriate. And I mean, I've been working on, um, on RFCs that definitely do take the Seabor approach rather than the extremely tight one. Um, and you know, partly that's just for a a code reuse um, aspect of things. When you have devices, especially constrained devices, uh, that use something to encode the data they send or decode the data they receive, then being able to share that code turns out to be really important. Um, and I'm not sure how reusable that is once you get into uh, schema-based parsers. I'm not sure, honestly. It maybe it's a better choice. I, and maybe I that's something to, that needs more investigation. I wanted to, um, in the time remaining, I wanted to reiterate that we should um, open up the floor to all of the um, speakers and all the, all the presentations that were made. Um, but there were a couple of comments in the chat that I want to lead that off with. Um, uh, and maybe d before moving off of the conversation about Seaborg um, and Jason, uh, to kind of uh, point out Vesna's comment about social engineering. Um, and so this is sort of broader, once again, like, is there something that a community can do um, similar to flying shame that Karsten pointed out? Can we come up with some kind of, and I'm reading this, can we come up with some kind of social pressure for people engineers being pressured against using the wasting, wasteful encoding, wasteful protocols, wasteful equipment, and towards the more sustainable option? So I wonder, um, are, are there folks out there who have an opinion about what is the social engineering that we can do um, to move these levers? Well, I'm not sure I'm, I, I have an answer to that question, uh, but I think it's related to, to one thing that came up um, in, in the chat, uh, which really is um, we are not trying to to make a, a rule here that you always must use Seabor where you used JSON before. But uh, really, the, the, the first step is to stop ignoring data representation formats as something that, that you have think, to think about in your protocol design. So the, the default choice of JSON may not always be the best choice. And if, if we get there, then we already have uh, one step. The next step might actually be uh, to get a little bit more, more 
um, information out so so people are not asking something like what, what's in the chat should we use SIBO or, or co-op this is like uh, asking yeah. whether you should use html or http um and um the third thing um we can make improvements in protocols uh without uh being entirely certain that the results will be significant this is again like flying to a conference. Whether you are flying to a conference or not is not going to to change the climate. Uh, but if you do it enough, then it starts making a, a difference. Yes. Um, so I think we, we do have to, to make considerations. Make yeah, a difference. we we do have to to uh, make the small steps too. By the way, I also tried to provide an answer on the chat already. So I'm I'm already seeing in industries that have constrained and unconstrained uh, devices in their use cases that they quickly recognize that when they start with the constrained protocols they can reuse them in the unconstrained case but obviously not vice versa and that helps to you know eliminate and a lot of further work uh, the reuse of the unconstrained protocols and duplicating the effort in the constrained world so in in these cases you don't need to do a lot of social engineering only when that case doesn't exist you may want to look it up like you know oh right now you have unconstrained use cases don't you think you'll have a constrained use case and that uh, would basically be then be the starting point to use from day one the constraint protocols Torless, I think that's a great observation and I, I think that that's something that we should really be considering from within the IETF and I, I, I would um, very much encourage people uh, to to take that to any working groups they participate in just bringing up the question of, you know, should we adopt constrained node networking techniques in, in our protocols since they are available, we know how to do them, and they mean that our protocols are more widely applicable. Karsten, did you have another question? Or you still have your hand raised. Okay. Um, I also wanted to return, even though, uh, uh, Russ has uh, sadly uh, had to leave the meeting. Chris Adams had raised a very interesting question. Again, it's more general than Russ's talk, so I, I would like to put it out there to the broader community. Um, Chris had asked, do any protocols include the, well, I'm, I kind of rearranged the wording, but it, it, it's basically, do any protocols include the ability to communicate how much longer they are able to sustain a given amount of throughput or latency? And um, so I wonder if folks might like to comment on that. Because I thought it was a question that, um, again, if we're um, gonna have some more interesting optimization uh, behaviors that, that the duration of um, certain metrics is quite interesting. And, and this is something that of course, orchestrators in data centers, which are controlled environments, are able to do because of their them being omniscient um, and knowing all the nodes that are participating and their interactions. Anyone aware of protocols that are doing that? I, I don't think it's something that can happen in real time, right? Like it's um, I, I, some of the constraint on protocols can consider that in the metrics, but I don't think it's like a specific thing that's done. Um, but uh, I think Pascal is on the call, right? He can talk about like role or something where this is kind of taken into account, but it's not like something that's specifically signaled. Pascal, are you on there still? Yes, uh, I, I'm still here. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are many design points in repo. Some of them were effectively uh, reused in Rift, for instance. So this has already happened. And as you said, the reasons are probably not for power, although there is a big impact on performance and power in Rift because it reused some concepts from Ripple. Now, um, I was more thinking about uh, IPv6 neighbor discovery, that there is a huge consumption of wireless resources which are related to the reactive procedures in traditional IPv6 neighbor discovery. And that's one big, big use case where we can look at what uh, uh, Sixth open has done for ND 
making it proactive and avoiding broadcast. And the use of broadcast due to ND and wireless is, is incredible. I mean, that's, that's a lot more than people think. We, we've, we've made a measure of how many broadcast packets were sent because of ND during a keynote by uh, our CEO at, at the Cisco Live, and it was 300 per second. Uh, well, it was a big room, right? It was, and, and most of that is effectively canceled because we have proprietary code in our uh, controllers and IPs, but the, the protocol itself is incredibly chatty, uh, and, and that's broadcast. And like I said, and, and like Norman has said, uh, wireless is not wired. For wireless, the, the, the uh, excess, every byte is paid cash. It's paid and double paid. It's paid once because you're uh, using spectrum and, and energy to send every extra byte, and it's linear to, to the number of bytes. It's paid, it's repaid because the more bytes you have in the air, the more chances you have of one losing this frame because every byte can be where you start you know, losing the frame. And second, that's when other devices might have to wait. And uh, so, so basically the load on your network and the queues form, et cetera, and this is additional energy. So basically, reducing the amount of broadcast on wireless is, is a critical thing to do, and ND is a big contributor. So, so the, this is a perfect use case for us to demonstrate how um, low power concepts can effectively benefit in, in wireless world, in, in any world, I mean, higher powers world. But maybe one other answer is the way I, I, I understand the question would be that in routing protocols, we have a way to carry schedule based information, something that applies to certain time ranges or time points in the future. And I don't think we have done that, but we had um, a buff at last IETF would uh, try to start it investigating that the time variant routing uh, buff. So maybe we are going to, to, to look into that problem. Um, Jan Lindblad, would you like to uh, make your comment that you just typed into the chat? Um, I think it's a really great question. Well, uh, perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one of the things that are consuming a lot of power in the IT industry is our monitoring. We are monitoring networks and devices uh, in a large scale, and we need to. But right now, uh, I think that much of that monitoring is happening in rather crude ways, even back to doing SNMP polls and other things that are, well, terribly inefficient, actually. And uh, we are doing this every few minutes with a lot of devices. And this is uh, consuming power that equals many nuclear power plants that are devoted to this all year round. So if we could do something to, to improve that, I think we could actually do uh, make a dent. And also what's been popular recently is to pour some of that data into data lakes and apply some sort of ML algorithm to that. And I, while that may be fun, uh, I'm not so sure it's power efficient. Right, and, and actually um, to uh, elaborate on that, I think that we're here we're asking to define metrics and to do more measurement to get more insights and yet our measurement monitoring infrastructure needs to sort of be self-reflective and be efficient itself. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Alex, looks like you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, I just wanted to respond. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I just wanted to respond to, to Jan. Uh, I do agree that uh, the way it's done is often if, uh, inefficient. However, that being said, there are alternatives, right? I mean, there is a lot of stuff. Um, well, from 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 streaming and subscribing to to to, to things to having basically certain event based uh, type of mechanism and so forth. Uh, so, part of this is again not the availability of or basically whether the, the technology isn't there. That is not the question, but the question is basically how do you use it and how do applications make their choices, uh, which which to use. So again, in part also awareness problem. Absolutely, and we have this. Uh, if we start to measure this, uh, really, where the power is going, maybe this will become more apparent, and more people will make a better choice. Chris, I believe you are next. Yeah, um, I just think a little bit on the, my, my question about some of that because one of the things that has come up, it seems, is that networks are massively over provisioned all the time, and uh, we're designing for the peaks rather than uh the average use cases and like 
there are other other sectors that do have to manage for peaks and also the and also uh, have averages which are much 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 lower and they've got different ways to kind of basically pay to make sure that there is capacity available and stuff like that like we can look in the energy sector to see how you have like peaker plants which are only on a few times a year or are like batteries and things like this that was why i was asking about is it possible to have something where you are able to say how long something is on because it, I, I kind of was thinking that we have ideas like say happy eyeballs and things for finding uh, two multiple low latency routes to kind of get to something if you know that there's maybe a low latency route that will last for a little bit of time that can buy a little bit of time for you to kind of default lots and lots of capacity to being off rather than being on by default. So rather than having to think about how you scale something down, you can flip it around to say, well, we've got a bit of kind of grace period to scale things up as, as we know this thundering herd is coming through. Maybe there's a kind of like flip in the way we think about this to make some of that possible because that is a possible way that we might think about this, I suppose. That was all that was all I wanted to share. Yeah, and I think Tarlis's response um, also is very uh, apropos, which is to um, have a look at some of the time variant discussion, time variant routing discussions for exactly this reason. If you actually understand um, and know a priori or can predict with high reliability um, uh, the behaviors of links, then uh, would how would our routing infrastructure change? I believe that Suresh was next. Uh, thanks, Eve. So I think one of the things I'm kind of like learning from this workshop is like there's a lot of people with a lot of knowledge in like specific pockets, right? Like, you know, where they know of like energy efficient alternatives and, and so on. But I don't think we've done a good job like collecting these things. So uh, so my higher level point was that um, sometimes people make these choices for a given reason. Like, you know, for example, like what Jan said, like somebody might have a legitimate reason for like pulling this 24 seven at like five second intervals or not, right? But I think um, it, it's. It, I think we should do something to kind of like bring up these kind of compromises, like you know what you get and what you don't get, like a binary encoding versus like text encoding. And there's like you know a bunch of things that came up, right? Like you know multicast versus not multicast. I, I don't think it's like a clear solution. One of them is better than the other, right? Like for the energy efficient difference, that's true. But like you know people have other problems to solve, right? This is not the primary problem to solve a lot of the time. So I think uh, it's in our interest to start putting these things together into some kind of document where we can actually talk about, hey, consider this. Have you thought about this, right? And 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 so on, right? Like for lack of a better term, like sustainability considerations or something like that, like to kind of start writing something up, but not necessarily like you know pushing people to put it into a document, right? Which is like probably something we can look at later, but at least for people to know, hey, there there are these choices, and for them to make the choice not by default. That's a great suggestion. And maybe it's a best known methods um, or considerations. Alex? I just wanted yeah. to add one more thing busy on the list of trade offs, uh, I guess, to consider. Uh, clearly, because prediction was mentioned, so so clearly, busy. If you if you if if you have prediction, if you have ways to better uh, predict what is coming and so forth, you can optimize uh, certain choices. But of course, in order to do the prediction, uh, that in itself is typically, or in in many cases, will be based on 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 obtaining more data, and uh, interpreting that data, uh, and so clearly we have that that, that other. Uh, trade off to go then basically how much is the addition expense of obtaining all that data, consuming this through your learning, matching whatever algorithms versus the benefit that you derive from that, from having better predictions to make better decisions. So true. <laughs> well, we have five minutes left. Um, and I'm wondering maybe for some of you who haven't spoken up. Would you, here's a moment maybe to ask your question that you've been dying to ask um, or anyone else who has a final remark. I really would like to thank everybody for the broad range of comments and, uh, and questions and presentations and thoughtfulness. It really has been, um, it's almost overwhelming the amount of information flowing from all up uh, all corners of the IETF, so to speak, all the layers, all the constituents. It's really been um, quite helpful. All right, uh, Yari or um, 
Colin, any final closing remarks? Yeah, I don't know. I think Colin wants to say something. I, I was um, try and, trying to figure out what, what did we actually uh, go through and what, what are the conclusions. And um, I wrote down uh, in my notes that, um, yeah, step one, awareness that this issues matter. Step two is visibility that we actually can, can measure and have metrics and so forth. Step three is improvements. Um, could be in many different places, implementations and um, and technology or even energy sources. And uh, it was interesting that a lot of this actually doesn't have to be a compromise. It can be a win-win for everybody that you can get more battery lifetime and faster network and uh, less energy use. But you also have to worry about some cases where you do have trade-offs and Russ talked about uh, some of those and that was very interesting. And then we had a uh, bunch of different directions were um things that we could do um, um automation that can optimize in small time scales uh slowing down systems in various dynamic ways um using better formats or interaction patterns that are actually designed for energy consumption also in mind um yeah lot, lots of good stuff i i'm very pleased with this session. So many people from different angles that were able to uh, provide information for, for everybody else. Thank you. We have one last session on Monday, and um, it is happening. It begins at the same time. Is it also a two hour session, Yuri? Uh, it is a, a 90 minute session. Okay. Um, so please show up. We need your inputs and debate and discussion, of course, as always. And we will post again the uh, the comments in the chat, which are equally uh, enticing and need further examination. In some cases, there's some great uh, pointers that have been included. Okay, great. Well, with that, we'll give you a minute back and uh, thank you for showing up. Thank you so much. Have a great week and all. Ah, yes. Have a, some of you are at the beginning of your weekend. Others of us are at the beginning of our day. <laughs> ah, yeah, but it will arrive soon, sooner or yes. later. <laughs> yes. Okay, Thank you very much, now. everybody. This is Goodbye. Good. Thank you. Goodbye.